Hello members, welcome and good evening. I'm Anna Spooner from the Wine Society and uh, delighted to have Mahesh behind the scenes tonight. Uh, we always log in a bit early and uh, just check all the tech and normally we have a bit of a natter but today all we talked about was terroir so um, hopefully Mahesh you'll enjoy working behind the scenes this evening. I know you're infused by the subject as well so thank you for joining us. Welcome members one and all. I hope that you're excited about this evening and if you are as lucky as I am to have all four wines tonight then I do encourage you now to just get them poured um, just because we're going to flip through things really really quickly and also to be honest the Pinot Noirs I wouldn't have decanted them per se um, but there's, they, won't, um, they won't lose any aroma between now and the time that we taste them in sort of half an hour. So um, if you have got the, I should also mention, if you have got the wines as well, uh, please do start tasting. And if you haven't got these exact wines, please start tasting. Hopefully you had the order already, but if you are tasting the Rieslings, um, then we first have got the um, the old vine, uh, ooh, sorry, the uh, Robert Stutzel, um old vine. Uh, and then the second one is the Nipster, uh, Kalk Merkel. Um, so if you are tasting along, that's the order. Or if you're bumping straight into the Pinot Noir, then we've got the Burgundy followed by the New Zealand. Obviously, if you're tasting something else, please just feel free to crack on. The lovely thing about the subject of terroir, terroir, pardon me, is that arguably any wine in the world could be used to demonstrate some of the things that we're talking about. Um, so, yes, dig in, enjoy, and fingers crossed I'll get through as much as I possibly can. Um, if you are using the chat today, please do use the drop down uh, section and click everyone. Otherwise, it's just Mahesh and I that see it. And it's only really even Mahesh because there's so much going on with slides and things. I might miss it as well. So it's much better if you're using the chat to let us know where you are and what you're drinking. Click everyone. And if you are using the Q&A to ask questions, you're far more guaranteed to be seen. Sorry, it was bad English. Uh, we've had some great questions coming in already. So thank you for that. So uh, what is terroir? Uh, <laughs> let's start with the challenging question, shall we? Um, nobody really has an answer. And um, there's a lovely uh, wine writer called Robert E. White, who vote, vote, wrote, um, has written a, a series of books, but he, he writes uh, particularly a book about wine land and soil. And uh, he defines terroir as a complex interaction of soil, local climate, cultivar, i.e. grape variety, and the winemaker's skill in determining the character or individual personality of a wine. Now, I find it quite hard to argue with that definition, but I do also appreciate that it's not agreed by all. And you could argue uh, perhaps that humans get quite a mention there. And is that true terroir? Or uh, you could also argue that he omits something that's very trendy at the moment, which is microbes. Um, microbes are creeping in big time to our idea of terroir. So what I would say is that if anybody's just joined and said, I've never even heard this word before, uh, there is no English definition. There is arguably not even a good French one, and it is a French word. Of course, terra, uh, from the Latin meaning soil, um, there's an association that it's to do with soils, but I think it is way beyond that. Um, I would also say that it hasn't, I'll go on to this a bit more in a minute, but it hasn't always been um, this trendy concept. If you were a French, uh, in a lot of my research, I kept coming across this idea that if you were a French child at school in a city, um, not so much now, but many years ago, sort of in the 50s, and somebody came into the school with a, a child came in with a country accent, a countryside accent, you would tease them by saying it was a terroir accent um, from the land. So it's not quite got the finite definition that we we need it to have. And it's been absorbed hugely by viticulture. We've grabbed it and said, yes, wine has terroir. But there are other things as well. So cheese, you often talk about uh, terroir with cheese makers, or at least they allude to it. Um, coffee, cocoa beans production. And I've even heard um, terroir be sort of used as a term in beer production for hops, the hops for beer production, sorry. So <clears throat> what is it? Well, 
there is an undeniable fact, which is that we basically have um, our appellation systems based on terroir. In whatever way you want to, to skin terroir, appellation systems were based on this subject. So um, other European, you know, it started in France, i.e. a designated area to recognize something, but it, it's everywhere. It's AVAs in America, it's other parts of Europe, it's American, um, sorry, uh, Australian GIs, geographical indications. All of these concepts are built on the sense of place. Now, I believe that um, terroir is a sense of place, but what is up for debate is what defines that sense of place. So <laughs> we'll give it a quick go. Let me run, pardon me, let you, I'm still a little tickly from COVID, but I feel fantastic. So apologies. Um, let me run you through a few little historical pinpoints that should be able to contextualize terroir for us. First of all, it isn't a new concept per se. So monks have been cultivating um, vines, but more importantly, assessing soils and assessing land since about the 8th century. So some notable monasteries uh, are places like the Cluny in the Maconay in Burgundy and um, Kloster Erbebach in Rheingau. Now, it's not a surprise that uh, those two places produce or are less so in the Rheingau, but certainly in Burgundy, dominated by one red variety, Pinot Noir. And in uh, the Rheingau, amazing examples of um, terroir from Riesling. So it's almost weird that through history, they've refined really far down to choose almost a monovarietal culture. Obviously, there's two varieties and a little bit more in Burgundy, and there are more in the Rheingau, but I think it's really interesting. So we'll talk more on that later. Um, history books obviously start with talking about soil. It's where the word comes from in Latin, the terra, um, t not terra, not terra, <laughs> t-e-r-r-a. Um, but it has grown to be more than that. So the only thing I would say, and Robin had an amazing question, I'm just going to bring it right in now, Robin. Um, how does, uh, oh, sorry, it wasn't Robin here. It's, I think, Frank Smith. Um, no, Robin, how does the man person on the Clapham omnibus recognize terroir and not just consider it to be a mythical or of commercial benefit? Now, that is a fantastic question, Robin. The reason I think it's a fantastic question is that terroir was really not in our lexicon as wine consumers until about 15, 20 years ago. Suddenly, there was a buzzword feeling about terroir. Um, there was a way to say, my wine is more special than my next door neighbor's wine. Mahesh and I have just been talking about that. Everyone claims to have the best terroir, and yet nobody can define it. Now, um, Robin, the cynic inside me says, yes, there's a marketing element to that. But of course, there would be in the same way that your brand is marketing. The name of your vineyard is marketing. Um, but for me, terroir can be a description. I'm going to show you a mad slide in a minute. But it can be a description of a lot of things. And just because we can't define it in a simple sentence doesn't mean that it's not true. So, yes, there is something uh, marketeering about it. There's definitely a commercial element, but there is an undeniable fact that I don't think we can escape that a certain set of ingredients create certain wines. And that to me is terroir. So what are we going to discuss? Um, I'm going to show you the scary slide. This is uh, produced by a, this slide is produced by a gentleman called, called Kies, Kies van Leeuwen, and he is a lecturer in viticulture at the University of Bordeaux. Um, this is actually not his most up-to-date slide, but he has done a more recent one that covers a lot of viticultural techniques, which we're not going to cover today. So I've actually taken an older slide of his, um, and I'm sure he won't mind. Uh, he's, he's added to it, basically. But the thing that almost everyone agrees on is that terroir is a, I'm going to come back to the word cultivated later, but terroir is an ecosystem, i.e. we cannot and should not separate these elements. That's my view that we should not, but we can't really. Um, so, yes, um, so this is climate up here and you've got radiation from the sun, CO2, atmospheric CO2. You've got water, i.e. rain. You've got temperature. Um, excuse the circles that they were um, keysers, not mine. Um, 
the, again, soil, we have water retention. We'll talk about all these things in a minute. But for example, everything is so connected that yes, climate is really important. We can see here, you know, climate affects the way a grape grows, but the climate is more significant if you all can also consider the grape variety. Climate alone has some importance, but once you factor in a grape, i.e. The, the plant material that has a different ripening time or uh, needs more, you know, temperature to grow, needs more water to grow, whatever it might be, suddenly it makes more sense. Um, suddenly this ecosystem, this idea of everything being connected, you cannot pick the things apart. Um, I think the only way that you can get focused is if you get um, as many variables as you can the same, which is really hard. Um, but let me give you some examples. So um, it's so it's almost impossible, but let's have an example. You have a beautiful vineyard. The whole place gets the same weather conditions all the time. Uh, you have exactly the same grapes on exactly the same rootstocks. Everything is the same, but you have a really strange chalk outcrop or you have a really strange outcrop of a different soil type. Now, there are parts of, of the world where this happens. There's amazing geology in Alsace, in, um, particularly in Alsace, it's the most varied, I would say, in the world, um, where you might have everything equal other than this, this strip of different subsoils. Um, or you might have two side-by-side -side vineyards, everything's the same, the soil's the same, all the stuff I just explained, but, you have a bank of trees protecting one vineyard from a really important wind. Now that can be essential in places like, um, uh, uh, like the Rhone, where protecting from the Mistral might completely change your, your grape production. So the really interesting one for me is, is weather, because almost vi vintage is like comparing all things remaining equal. So assuming that the winemaker, well, the vineyard has, has not changed the way uh, they're doing anything in the vines. Everything's remained equal. The grapes are the same, but we have year on year difference. The problem we have is that feels like almost the perfect way to say, ah, oh, this is what a cold vintage tastes like. Ah, oh, this is what a rainy vintage tastes like. However, we have this little end person, the human, that does make a change. So the winemaker is going to slightly affect how the wine is produced. So even then, when you've got almost all things equal, but you've got different levels of rainfall and sunshine, et cetera, you still will have somebody at the end making slight differences to the way the wine's made. So it's almost impossible to nitpick and pull apart terroir because it's so, you know, incredibly linked. Um, the reality is experiments do happen. So I was recently in Bordeaux um, and we, we went to a vineyard who they very kindly showed us an experiment they're doing. They had, and some of you have heard the story, I apologize, um, uh, on exactly the same vineyard with exactly the same soils, exactly the same grapes picked at exactly the same time. They had a vineyard that was traditionally harvested, i.e. old conventional um, uh, using a, a lot more product. There was one from uh there was one that was organic and there was one that was biodynamic and they had almost taken these three sections made the wine identically and then allowed us to taste it now that level of experimentation is an experiment those wines won't reach the consumer so it's such a shame i'll probably never do an experiment like that in my life it was fascinating the three wines tasted completely different because of the way the vineyard was managed so there we go. I've seen it happen. I know that it can happen. Um, and we're not even going to talk too much about vineyard management today. We're going to talk about all the intrinsic things. Um, so, yeah, challenging. Um, so rest assured, I'm not going to give you a perfect answer, but let's at least break apart uh, some of the components that I've just shown you so we can actually begin to recognise some concepts, what the changes are in those concepts and how that might affect what's in your glass. Because after all, that's what we care about, don't we? What's the end wine? So um, there are various, let's start with soil. Let's work from the ground up. Um, soil's the big one. It's the sort of the, the root of the word, if you want to. <laughs> I, would, I didn't mean to have a pun there. Um, but it's also going to be a really good um, subject to talk about our first two wines. So I will shout out now that various scientific studies have tried and failed 
to identify a causal relationship between soil and specific flavors. What I mean by that is you cannot actually taste a soil technically. So when a wine tastes flinty, um, so let's say a Chablis, there is no evidence and it has yet to be proven and a lot of people think it's bogus to say that because there is that flinty flavor somehow in the wine that has come directly from the flavor or the component of the flint in the soil. Now, I did have a question uh, which was from Frank Smith, which was a fabulous uh, question. Minerality is a trendy descriptor at the moment. Agreed, Frank. Please would you comment on what that means to you and the evidence that differing soils or subsoils contribute to a wine's taste? I hope I'm going to do some justice um, here, Frank, because what I'm essentially saying is that it's not necessarily the taste. You can't isolate that taste. You can't say that a um, you can't say that a, a chalky soil creates a chalky flavor, a flinty soil creates a flinty flavor. There is no evidence to suggest that. But there is plenty of research to suggest that um, soil impacts the vine and therefore the grape and therefore the subsequent wine and that you can make correlations. It's not that the soil is getting drawn up through the plant and producing a flavor. It's that there is a there is a chain reaction almost a series of events that occur on certain soils that um, that make wines taste the way they do. Now, I wanted to just show you this because everybody always talks about chalk, limestone, marl. They're the, you know, they're the ones that, um, that are the sexy wines. Uh, not necessary, not necessarily. Um, these are all different. I've picked a handful of soils here, but I wanted to show you. Um, I shouldn't really have put Porto, sorry, for schist. Um, sorry, I should have put the Douro. Um, <laughs> you have to forgive me. But um Yes, there's lots and lots and lots of very, very top quality wine grown on chalk, limestone, marl, sandstone style soils. And that a lot of people say, well, it's the calcium uh, carbonate. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But a lot of people say that's what makes these wines taste great. Well, then you're basically saying that the clay that's in Sautern and, and Pomerol Grand, Cru Grand Cruz, you know, doesn't exist. Nebbiolo de Alba, one of my favorite wines in the world, it's on sand. Uh, Beaujolais, Schist, and um, well, I spoke at length about it yesterday, but some of the top, top Beaujolais yesterday, last week, <laughs> are on granite, um, sorry, and then the really, really schisty soils in the likes of Porto and the Moselle, and those are slates as well. So, um, just one more quick thing I'd like to say is that the before we go headstrong into these two wines that are relatively geologically close together, but on different soils. Um, Keys van Leeuwen, who I mentioned earlier, says that there are important elements in wine. Um, in fact, bear with me, I might have. Oh, I don't have it. Sorry. Uh, I had a slide that was the important elements um, in wine on soils in particular. Um, drainage is essential. Um, so, oh, sorry, I've got a dog, a poorly dog running up the stairs. Uh, drainage is essential. He calls it water status, but actually drainage affects the wine, the vine's performance to a certain degree. Uh, you need good drainage, but you need to be able to store water in the soil as well. Temperature. Temperature is essential. Um, I've just mentioned clay soils. Those clay soils, you cannot ripen Cabernet Sauvignon to the same extent on the right bank. But in the Pomerol Grand Cru, 60% are clay and they're the best soils for Merlot. So here you start to see where soil and grape interact. Um, whereas in the Moselle, the, the dry slates, they absorb the heat in the day and then radiate it back at night with that dark colour to aid ripening. Um, and then whilst, yeah, whilst we don't actually pick up flint aromas we do need to still think about the composition of the soil so not just things like drainage which composition is important but things like how much nitrogen is in our soil that affects quality and um, there's a sweet spot if you have lots of nitrogen you can get leaf crowding too little nitrogen can affect the ageability of your wine um, so there's a lot going on basically in soils and it's not to do with pulling flint from the ground to go back to our previous question so let's talk about why we care about soils in Riesling in particular. It is a very reflective grape of terroir. It really um, is the mirror and it shows you uh, 
um, soil, more so I'd argue than any other white grape. I think most people would agree with me there. Um, and in fact, there was a study in 2009 um, by Lon Hertz and, well, et al., so some pals. <laughs> and it showed scientifically that Riesling can produce a variety of different styles of wine on different soils. And I've only got the findings rather than the research, but I suggest probably because it's it's a published study, they have kept a lot of, um, you know, they've reduced the variables. So they're not having Riesling grown in limestone in a hot place and granite in a cold place. Um, but to give you a couple of pinpointers, limestone soils, um, everyone always says, oh, they give this high acidity. Actually, no, limestone soils were not proven to affect the pH of the wine. Uh, that hasn't been proved. And uh, quartz-esque soils actually were proven to give a more mineral flavor, but that's through the grape and not through picking up quartz, if that makes sense. But crucially, more than anything, more than the actual soil itself, it was water status that had a greater influence. And actually the wines that experienced water deficit during the growing season had more body. They completely changed the style of wine with having water deficit. So the two wines we're gonna look at uh, here. So we've got a wine, I'm gonna get my North and South right here. <laughs> um, we've got a wine from Southern part of Baden-Baden. Yeah. And we've got a wine from the northern part of Faltz. So we're going to start with the Baden-Baden wine first. Um, and we are going to discuss soils, <clears throat> but um, we're going to taste the wines as well. And I'm going to let you make your call um, and you can tell me what you think. But uh, this, this wine, uh, I'll tell you why the granite matters. And I'm not going to tell you any of the flavors, but I'm going to tell you why granite is important. This is from a weathered granite um, site and granite struggles to hold water. So for, um, for many vines, that can be a problem. Uh, Eddie Faller of Domain Vinebeck calls it a poverty soil, um, which I actually love. I think that's amazing that granite is a poverty soil. Um, but what he means is that it's not rich in nutrients, it's not rich in water, and the vines have to dig really deep. Now for, oh, I've got the wrong wine up, sorry. There we go. Um, uh, for anyone who is, um, I hope members, I told you to do it in this order. This was my plan. So please make sure that you're tasting the Alta Reben uh, if you aren't, taste it now. Um, because this wine is um, very interesting. It's got these, yeah, sorry, <laughs> got myself in a muddle. It's got these granite sores. It can't hold water. The vines have to dig really deep. But anyone that speaks German will know that Alto Reben means old vines. And that is really, really important in this granite soil. I don't know, but I suspect a young vine would really struggle here. Um, but one thing about granite is that the yields are often smaller. Um, and so they tend to make really intense, rich wines. So have a taste. Let me know in the chat what you're thinking. Mm. I love it. Really lovely, refreshing, light. Um, it's got a, a higher pH, this soil. Some studies have said that higher pH, i.e. alkaline, not acid. So an alkaline soil tends to promote high acidity. Um, I'm yet to find a scientific study that proves it, but a lot of people have said, you know, in various literature that high alkaline soils tend to produce higher acid wines. And that the evidence that's supporting that is apparently all the fertilizers that lowered the pH in France um, that they put on, i.e. made the, well, the soils more acidic, actually lowered the acid in the final wine. Jury's out. Don't quote that one. <laughs> um, right. And I'm sorry there's no picture of this wine. So if you have got the Nipsa, um, beautiful, beautiful wine. I love that these two are the same price as well. So we're really comparing a nice like for like. This wine is from Felt and it's characterized by a high, high lime content. So more limestone soils. Again, very alkaline soils, but much better draining than our previous wines. So we don't need those old vines quite as much. I am guaranteed, I've got to tell you, I am getting a more mineral thing here, but I'm also getting a touch of, and it's a touch, touch, touch 
of TDM. So that sort of slightly kerosene note, although here it's not petrol yet. It's much more like lime cordial, which I love. Um, I think for me, it's kind of less fruity and more of that savory note, if that makes any sense. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about TDN is that uh, people have apparently started to see a trend between TDN and um, more acidic soils. Uh, now, I've already just told you this is an alkaline soil, but the other thing to throw in the mix is that they're also finding soils with low nitrogen are producing more TDM. So as I said, everything's correct, collect, ugh, connected. You can't necessarily extrapolate everything, um, but it's just something to think about. TDM and that sort of um, lime cordial going into petrol note is something that could be, they believe potentially associated with the acidity of the soil, or I should be more specific, the pH of the soil and also of the nitrogen content. So soils might be, they believe, um, affecting this. Again, it's so hard to do the tests, um, but they think it might have something to do with it. It's got, it has got this really intense lime cordial thing for me and wet stones, wet rocks. So let me know what you think. How is low nitrogen defined, Roger? Good question. Um, so it's incredible the tests you can do with soils now. I was about to just look, I've got loads of papers next to me. Um, I'll answer it at the end because there is a test you can do for nitrogen and there are parameters on low and high, so I will find you. Um, and someone's asked, what is TDM? <laughs> so TDM is actually a chemical compound. It is a trimethyl di trimethyldidronopethylene. Um, and it is a compound, uh, so TDM is just the short name, and it gives eventually that petrol note um, that Riesling has, but before that, it gives uh, that sort of lime cordial. Um, I'm told by lots of Australians, there's a specific brand of lime cordial it gives off as well. Um, again, I can send you the proper chemical compound. It is a very long word. <laughs> right, so, oh, I haven't tasted that. <laughs> mm. I mean, I did taste it earlier both delicious. I get a lot more salinity, like I mentioned, those savoury notes on that one. Both have great acidity. I would probably say structurally, I find the nips are slightly more um, mouthwatering in terms of the acidity, but there's not much in it, both very, very high acid. But can you see, same grape variety, not grown very far apart. Um, yes, one is a year older than the other, and it might surprise you that the first wine is actually the older one. Um, but tasting completely different, um, even though they've both been made in similar ways. So that's fun. <laughs> that's experiment one. Um, we spent a lot of time on, on soil soils, so I won't spend too much time I'm on. I'm going to talk geology or particularly here topography and geomorphology. Um, there are a few things to bear in mind. One is that that slopes are very important. So when I'm talking geology here, I'm really talking formations of rock, aren't I, I suppose, um, or formations of, of the land rather than the soil and the subsoil. So um, slopes are really important because they enhance um, erosion, which can be a good thing. They keep those topsoils limited um, by the nature of, of how they are. Um, and grapes tend to be best on the slopes that have the shallower topsoils. Um, granted, it can be a disaster. Erosion can ruin your vineyards and you don't need to tell someone in the northern Rhone who's you know, has to build trellises, et cetera, to, um, and um, walls to keep their vines uh, in the soils, but it can be excellent. Um, also slopes, chilled air is denser, so it flows downhill and then is replaced by warmer air from, from the land beneath it um, or below it, or sort of convecting. Uh, so that's really important and that completely changes. If you've got a flat vineyard where that convection is not happening, you could get frost, whereas a slope um, would enhance your erosion, but it also just changes the composition of the air. Exposure influences radiation. It gets, um, it influences how much, uh, you know, sort of, <laughs> I like to think of it as sunbathing. Um, sitting up in your sunbed, you get a better suntan. It's a fact. <laughs> rather than lying down um and then things um yeah and then finally i guess 
altitude and the changes of temperature. I'm not going to go into this too much because we've got an amazing um, few speakers on wines with altitude next week. Um, but 100 meters of altitude can change the temperature by anything, depending on the where you are in the world, by 0, 0 0.5, half a degree to several degrees um, in, in certain places. So altitude and the changes of temperature, they're linked. But the altitude is what I'm talking about here with the uh, geomorphology. And then another thing just linked into soils that I would love to do a whole entire webinar on, but I will be honest, I'd have to probably research it for two weeks in order to do it. Um, but I watched a fantastic uh, interview with Lara Katena uh, from the Katena Institute in Mendoza um, yesterday, who briefly talked about it. And I'd love to hear her talk on it more at some point. Um, but she has proven, she claims, um, that rhizobacteria, which are the bacteria that live around the roots, can actually assist in producing more chlorophyll. Um, and if those, if that happens, then the plant is photosynthesizing better and you're getting things like riper fruit and it's got a real knock-on effect. Um, other things we should consider are native yeasts. Um, the next two wines we're going to try both use native yeasts. And it's quite common for winemakers who are really saying they express their terroir to when they're fermenting, use the yeast that was in the vineyard and not the yeast that they bought from a packet, which is perfectly, you know, packet yeast is a godsend um, because the native yeasts can be naughty little things. Um, but uh, there's an argument that maybe native yeast is a better expression of terroir. They are, after all, sort of grown in the vineyard and in the, in the wine cellar. Now, the ability to analyze microbiology is increasing, and I think that's why people are realizing how important it is. So personally, watch this space. Um, it's a hugely growing area, and I really don't think um, we'll be able to leave it out of, of a um, of a terroir slide in, in two, three, maybe five years time. It will be completely essential. So let's go back to that terroir slide. We've talked about um, the ground things. We've talked about water. We've talked about nutrients. We've talked about aspect slopes, et cetera, uh, geomorphology, et cetera. Let's jump up to the sky, as it were, <laughs> um, and have a quick chat about some things that affect uh, climate and what that might taste like in wine and also plant material. We're going to briefly touch on plant material. Um, and I do mean really briefly. We are not going to have um, much chance to talk about viticultural techniques today. And I apologize for that in advance and no, no time to talk about vit vinification and aging. Um, it's just too much to talk about. So I thought I'd focus on sort of this section here, which is what we all classically think of as terroir. Um, so let's talk climate because it's quite fun to compare the next two wines using climate and plant material to an extent, but certainly climate. So lovely long map of Burgundy here. A uh, little bit about Burgundy is that the summers are warm. They are quite cloudy sometimes, and the winters are much colder. They are actually windy and cold. Um, over the course of the year, I'll show you where the wine's from in a moment, but um, in fact, sorry, I'm just going to jump ahead because it makes sense for me to show you this whilst I talk in a second. Um, but over the course of the year, typical temperatures in Burgundy can go anywhere from naught degrees to sort of 26. Um, and that's what you're seeing here, naught to 26. Um, obviously, we've got a northern hemisphere. I made this graph earlier on a website. So please, um, a wonderful website, Weather Sparks. Um, and I've had to use Christchurch because they didn't have Central Otago. Um, and obviously it's Burgundy, which is a big place. So bear with me, but it is it is factually relatively <laughs> pretty perfect. It just needs a bit of assistance in, a, in an explanation. Um, but Burgundy has these sort of warm summers um, that are clouded over, but they're up at 26 degrees. And then it gets down to about zero. Obviously, we, we hear about freezing and that's not always the case. We can dip a little bit below zero. But these are average mean temperatures. Um, sorry, that's the same thing. Um, but typically, this is the range they stay in. Conversely, New Zealand, particularly, um, well, the whole of New Zealand is maritime. And that body of water surrounding New Zealand that we can see here in this map, um, this affects the temperature quite significantly, but it also brings in rain. Now, the um, 
the being on the southern hemisphere the cooler island is very cool and this is obviously the coolest growing region in um new zealand there are some what are they called are they the southern alps I think so, that do protect central Otago slightly, but certainly there is a moderating effect. And we can see that here. Christchurch, I know I've put Christchurch, I really mean central Otago, but it's the nearest weather station to central Otago. 22 degrees is their average high. So you would have normally thought, oh, I'm getting this really voluptuous fruit from my New Zealand Pinot Noirs. It must be warmer. All this ripeness must, must mean extra warmth. It's too complicated to just have that. Um, yes, Christchurch is cooler, but there's other things going on or, or central Otago. And it doesn't actually ever quite get as cold either. So we have a much narrower um, band that we're working with um, between the two regions. So I hope that you don't hate my very poor <laughs> graph making. I've got some even worse ones in a moment. Um, but what's important to say is that um, if New Zealand's South Island doesn't get as hot as Burgundy, then why do we get these, these flavors that we're about to experience? Why do we get darker fruits? Why do we get more blue fruits um, and less of that kind of red tart fruit? One of the reasons is that heat alone is not enough and it's actually very sunny in New Zealand. And um, it's also did have a hole in the ozone layer, which actually is kind of gone now and irrelevant, but it's still sunnier. And that high UV content, um, that light and that UV has been, is being proven at the moment to, um, in fact, Lara Katena's uh, winemaker described it perfectly yesterday. It's like a parent. The grape goes, oh my goodness, I need to protect the seeds. And so they grow a thicker skin. So the skin around the grape gets thicker because of the sunlight. It acts as a sunscreen. And what that can do is sometimes it can create darker flavors. It can also create um, sort of more blue currant and blueberry flavors. Yes, for sure. Um, but it can also create a different kind of tannin. Now, a lot of people say that, that um, Central Otago produces some of the best Pinot Noir in the world mainly Oregon, Central Otago get banded around as the second places after, after Burgundy, but they're certainly not of the same style and not a mimicking style. So when we go in to taste them, and if you haven't already, please start, I will be joining you in just a second. But not only are we talking about temperature when we're talking about these sorts of things, but we're talking about um, growing degree days, you know, how many um, or how regularly is the temperature over a certain level. We're talking about how many clouds are in the sky to let those UV, let that UV come through. It can't just be as simple as, is this place hot and is this place cold? Doesn't work like that. So I have got, if you're interested, and I'll send them around. It was a particularly warm year in this central Otago. Uh, this is the actual stats for the years that we're talking about, because um, we've got central Otago in 2019. Ooh. It's not happy with me there. Central Otago in 2019 and then, there we go, Burgundy in 2014. Um, I will send these around. We don't need to spend ages looking at graphs. But what's quite interesting, I would say, is that Burgundy did in this growing season have some quite high peaks and they lasted for a few days. So there was almost like this, this temperature rising and then it fell down again. You cannot really say the same in Central Otago in 2019. Um, of, I don't know about you members, but I have to keep remembering that their summer is our winter. It's mad, but my brain doesn't work like this. Um, but in January, February, they had, they almost had, you know, um, they get these kind of like warm spikes where it's obviously very sunny, but then the temperature is coming back down again. So there is less of that consistent sunshine, which I think is very interesting and certainly um, affecting the flavors. Um, so, for our first wine, we are in the Cote de Nuit, uh, which is a lovely section within just uh, here. Let me just pop you there. This is particularly where we are, which is Vent Romani. Um, this particular wine actually comes from a small vineyard that lies between a couple of Grand Cru vineyards. And you can kind of see where that happens here. There's these red patches of Grand, Grand Cru, and it's kind of just in this, this little nice green nook here. Uh, I would argue it's not quite lies between, but it, it's certainly a great site. Um, 
it is, uh, so the soils, the reason I picked these two wines is they're quite similar for a few reasons. The soils in both these wines are limestone clay mixes. This is a pure limestone and clay mix. The other soil has um, some packets of schist and graphite. I'll confirm that in a moment. It's on the back of the label. <laughs> but think about it. We've talked about what that means. We've talked about limestone affecting potentially the pH with, with the calcium. Um, so potentially producing a wine that has a higher acid content. It did that for um, it did that for Riesling. Is it going to do it for Pinot Noir? Um, but we've also got some clay soils. Now, clay is quite a dense soil. So are we expecting some sort of um, quite robustness in our in our um, wine. And I don't mean that you're picking up the density of the soil, but it doesn't. Um, we've already discussed it's it's a cold soil. Um, so the, the grapes have to work quite hard. So we might not get a kind of um, fresh, elegant style necessarily, although this is, of course, uh, with where it's coming from. But it might be slightly more. Uh, intense from those clay soils. Um, it's easterly exposure, so it gets some nice morning sunshine. Vines are between 50 and 110 years old, and both of these are made with low intervention. This is actually biodynamic. I will mention biodynamic if I have time. Um, but <clears throat> there's other than a few small doses of sulfur, doesn't add anything. So we're talking native yeasts in both of these wines. I've already mentioned that a little bit. Um, let me pop it up for you. It is not a cheap wine, it is £45, and it's also older than the other wines. So bear that in mind. It's a museum release at uh, 2014. For me, on the nose, it's got this kind of um, lovely red fruited fragrance. 2019 was a cooler vintage um, overall. I know I showed you the spikes, but overall it was a cooler or certainly um, cooler than the previous couple of vintages in, um, in Burgundy. And I think you can smell that from the gorgeous red fruits. It's particularly red fruited. But as Toby has mentioned here, it is a medium bodied wine. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not as good as, as him on, on the terroir of Burgundy itself. But certainly um, for me, I think clay soils and I do think of that body elevating. So have a taste if you haven't already. Mm. <laughs> Oh, so scrummy. It is still very red fruited for me. It's turning into that slight tertiary. So I'm getting just those notes of, not, I always say wet leaves and people think that's a horrible thing. It's really not. Uh, wet leaves, um, it's just going into that kind of um, slightly leathery, uh, meaty phase, which is absolutely delicious, but still packed with red fruits, cranberries, cherries, raspberries, um, but not freshly picked, um, I would say. It hasn't got that sweetness to it. Now, uh, for me, it does have a decent amount of tannin. You know, it's not a light and airy fairy wine. It's got some muscle to it. Um, and I also wonder whether those, let's just, you know, consider, we talked about extra sunshine hours and that, you know, maybe that little mini heat spike in 2014 made those grapes do a little bit of protect the... Um, protect the seeds so when you hear about these heat spikes you can now start to think okay well maybe that's protecting the seeds maybe we're going to get the skins growing a bit thicker that might mean a little bit more color it might mean a bit more tannin if you do want to compare the color of the two wines I think that's the most telling thing actually in these two wines the prophet's rock is so much darker because those skins have gone even thicker um I would say for me, that is just the most classic Burgundy and it's a real um, crowd pleasing Burgundy. It's got enough muscle to appeal to people that, that don't want their wine sort of thin, worst word ever, but often what, what non-Burgundy lovers might describe it. It does have enough oomph, um, but it's a great cracking, cracking, cracking wine, that one, um, with this beautiful freshness. And again, are we getting that from the limestone soils? Perhaps. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've got loads of questions, so I will go through them um, as, as best I can. Um, but I would love to talk about Prophet's Rock. Um, it is a, um, there's quite a few differences, but quite a few similarities to this wine. So it's a much higher elevation. Now, one of the things that that's going to do is it's going to counter, uh, we mentioned elevation, we mentioned the, you know, the temperature reducing. Um, it is going to be reduced 
but we're already in a place that's sunnier. So we've got two things almost slightly contradicting each other, but that sunny, sunny um, uh, area with higher UV, thicker skins. So we're going to get the more color. We're going to get some more sunshine hours. We're going to get the bluer fruits from those sunshine hours because the grape's going to develop longer on the vine and more intensely. But we might also get really nice lifted acidity from the higher altitude slope. Um, the two different rocks that are in addition here to the limestone and yes, so there's um, a limestone soil and a clay, but it features uh, pockets, I guess, of schist and quartz. Now, um, we've already talked about quartz and schist in particular, um, you know, particularly with reference to um, the darkness of the soils. So that might also help with some heat retention, should we say, at that high altitude and then that particularly uh, challenging cool climate right on the south. Made in a really similar way. Um, oh, I should also say quartz. If, sorry, I'm going back to the Riesling, but quartz was shown to show minerality in Riesling. Now, is it going to show minerality in our Pinot Noir? Who knows? Um, what's different about these wines is there's no evidence of the clones, i.e. the, the subspecies that's not what they are bad 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 science but the clones the different sort of mini variants of the type of pinot noir that went into um our Vaud romany um but this we know is a blend of seven um there is that probably just hedges some bets if i'm really honest because i don't think you would there's no taster on the planet that could pick out seven clones of pinot noir in a blend um but it's nice to know that they've hedged their bets uh minimal ex extraction so they don't spend ages putting the skins uh, in with the juice. They have barrel aged this for 17 months, uh, whereas the Vosges Romani was, I did know this. I think it was quite similar and that was the point. Um, and they were 50% new. Yeah, sorry, it's, uh, they bottled it in the 15th of February and, and it was a vendage of the 19th of September of two years prior. So one year probably in barrel for this. 50% new, slightly longer here, 17 months um, with some new oak as well, unfiltered and bottled, ready to go. So quite similar winemaking. So give it a taste. Mm. Ooh. Quite a different experience, right? For those of you who are tasting along much richer fruit i know it's a younger wine but the fruit tastes much sort of sweeter and riper and it's blue to me it really is blue um bordering on red but lots and lots of brute blue fruit um the tannins are not dissimilar to me actually they've got quite a similar tannin structure um but the flavors are completely different. And if we start to think, you know, there are many things that are equal in these wines. So the soils are, are pretty equal. You get some arguments from both sides that that's not true, but they're as equal as we can get them. One, one of them has not been grown on schist or, you know, granite full soil. So they've got similar soil composition. They've got the same grape variety. Um, they've got similar winemaking. So we've taken out as many influences as we can. And what we're tasting here is really that that upper section of the diagram. It's the climate um, and it's the sort of external factors from outside. So it's these things here we're really tasting in particular, um, which I find fascinating. And to be honest, that's really the thing that I think most of us can pick out more easily, weather, climate. They have such an impact on the plant material. Um, that it is, it is something that we can start to recognise when we're tasting wine. So last but not least, <laughs> I just wanted to mention, because I don't want to ignore it, and I know that it's a bit of an elephant in the room, and I mentioned it earlier, but humans are essential. I've seen a couple of things popping up on biodynamics. I'd probably argue that that biodynamics and things like natural sap flow prunings, so making gravity uh, better assisted during pruning, those are almost things where we're trying to take step back and intervene less and say, OK, hey, let's let the terroir do its thing. Um, a lot of people would say that biodynamics is the sort of sense of sense of best way to get a sense of place. But you can't take the humans out. We decide when to pick the grapes. We decide what way to plant the grapes. We decide which rootstocks, which clones. We haven't even talked about those today. 
we decide, you know, orientation of the vines, and then we decide all of the winemaking. So you cannot pull humans out of this puzzle. It's impossible. Whether you think that it's authentic to the terroir, or whether you think that if a human changes the wine, you know, if a winemaker changes, does does the human change? Um, does the human influence change? Uh, do people tend to carry on traditions? That's the other big argument. A lot of these places have a tradition. So even when the winemaker changes, you might not notice considerably um, what, what's, um, what's changed in the wine. All I mean is it's impossible to pull human influence out of terroir, but it's really up to you. And I think my jury is out about whether I want the human to be as involved in terroir. Does it ruin the romanticism a little bit of the idea? So, um, yeah, have a think about that. Um, we've already had a couple of people say things. Yeah, exactly. Biodynamics does require more human intervention. You've got to make preparations. You've got to apply them. Maybe you could argue that actually driving a tractor up and down the vineyard is ruining the soil. So that's having more influence. Um, humans are unavoidably involved in this process. And so you've got to make your call on on where you land, on whether they fit in your your terroir diagram, or or as I've come to think of it the last few days, the terroir jigsaw, <laughs> which I think is just the better way of describing it. Um, right, I've got nine minutes until the, the technical um, <laughs> the technical end of the session. If I don't answer your question, and you're still desperate to know the answer, then please, please, please email me. Uh, if you have to shoot off, I know it's a little bit later this this particular one if you have to shoot off to go and have some dinner I wouldn't blame you um but of course you can catch up on YouTube if you want to, to um get the questions afterwards um so let's start with the central Otago question from Mark Phelps because I think this is very interesting he has asked do the higher tannins and darker fruit in central Otago mean that there is greater potential for aging <laughs> no is the answer <laughs> um they of course it can and it depends how you like your wines but i think um and it also we haven't probably got enough evidence on central otago wines and what they can do in the future if you think about central otago why grapes weren't really grown there until about 25 years ago so we have a very very short window of experimentation and i think one of the things about experimentation is um, sorry that about terroir is it's really linked to experimentation so um, no wonder they worked out that Pinot Noir could make long-lived delicious wines in Clove de Beaujau because they tended that vineyard the same monks for 700 years <laughs> so a lot of the world is new world bad term but um, a lot of the um, less developed wine world is is playing huge catch up and thank goodness for science because they can start to work out what they want and don't want but there's certainly no um, concrete evidence at the moment that would show that central otago wines would or wouldn't age better um aging though can be down to a few other different things and i've got a, a um webinar in the pipeline on this um tannins yes they can certainly con convey some aging but pinot noir does buck the trend on that you don't have to have a high tannin pinot noir in order for it to age well um but things like fruit concentration this does have really good fruit concentration um but it might not necessarily go as long as an old pinot noir also it depends what you like flavor wise i love and i think i saw peter cousins maybe pop up saying he liked um this as well but i love the red fruit and almost red meat or irony flavors that I get from old Pinot Noir. I don't know, and I'm inexperienced as a taster, I don't know what a 20-year-old Prophet's Rock would do, but I don't know if, don't know if anyone does. Um, and does that have the same experience? So yes, um, the answer is, we don't know. I suspect they will take some time to get them to be really long lived, but they certainly have come a long way in a very short space of time. And Central Otago definitely deserves to be cellared. And let's see what happens to it. Um, Frank Smith has asked, is minerality in wine similarity to the differences between tap and some spa water? I suppose the difference is what we're talking about um, is uh, when roots are taking up things from the soil, they are, when we're talking about flint not being able to taste as flint, flint is not soluble. Only soluble components can be taken up by the little hairy feelers on the end of the on the end of the roots. Um, spa and tap water is different because you're actually consuming some of the minerals um, that are present in the water floating around, um, but you are consuming it. The roots can't take up 
those sorts of minerals that we're talking about that you associate with taste per se so yes we've talked about nitrogen we've talked about calcium we've talked about um potassium those three are, are evidently important nitrogen being a particularly important one because that is really involved in being um taken up and used by the plant um but when you're consuming a uh, tap water mineral water spring water whatever it is um you're actually consuming minerals as opposed to the plant which can't consume them so something else is happening there's an interim chemical reaction going on that we haven't got our fingers on or our brains around yet um Oh, I've got an interesting question from Nick Beachino. Beachino, I apologise, and, and sorry if I I missed the point of this question. But can modern winemaking overcome terroir shortcomings? Um, if I don't ask this correctly, I apologise, but I'm going to put my spin on it. Um, there was an argument, and there is is a good argument that a lot of modern winemaking that was overly, um, you know, uh, too much oak too much um extraction basically you were tasting things like vanilla pie in your chardonnay or, or vanilla you know rather than rather than a, um, a sense of place that was quite popular in modern winemaking um and by modern i will name names and i will mean people that came up quickly like australia new zealand uh america to an extent chile and argentina as well um They've pulled back so much now because terroir and a sense of place is far more interesting. But on the NW exams, what's fascinating is that they are less and less asking you about where something comes from because it's becoming harder to tell. So modern winemaking almost muddied the water and terroir became um, terroir became indistinguishable between a lot of these regions and sometimes still is. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think it's it's overcoming a short. Uh, sorry, I don't think it's overcoming a shortcoming of terroir. I think actually what's happening is someone in Limerie Valley is saying, hold on, um, you know, we make this amazing Chilean Chardonnay that tastes nothing like any other Chardonnay in the world. Let's strip back our oak. Let's strip back this and let's make something that has this sense of place that everyone is desiring to have. Um, right, I'm going to be really quick on a few more. Claire has written in the chat, aren't grapes mainly water? They are, Claire, but they've gone through a they've gone through a, a third party. Um, and that third party is the vine. So if you want to go and eat the dirt, then you'll get as much flint as you like. But if you're eating the grape, then sadly, <laughs> sadly not. Um, another question about the importance or not of chalk for English fizz. Great question. And again, the jury is really out on this one. There are some really smashing English fizz that has no that have no um, chalk or limestone in them. What we've just talked about is potentially alkaline soils are being proven to produce higher acid wines. But there are way, you know, there's a spectrum of alkaline soils. So you don't necessarily need chalk to produce English sparkling. I think that's a bit of a myth that the uh, vineyard owners with lots of chalk like to peddle. Um, you don't need it, um, but that's certainly something that can, you know, the chalk and the alkaline, the calcium carbonate that makes the soil alkaline in a chalk soil is actually the thing that's increasing the acidity. But you could have a mild soil with calcium carbonate that would would be, you know, just fine. Um, or you could have another alkaline soil, as we discussed in our Rieslings. Um, so do, 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 I'm just going to see if I can get squeeze one more in. Um, Tim Jones lived on a while at the end. I, I haven't read this in advance, so I apologize. Um, uh, I lived for a while on the edge of, of the Jura. Sauvignon is very distinctive, but the Chardonnay is also quite characteristic and has a sherry taste. So in the Sauvignon direction, is that mainly winemaking or also the soil? Ah, great question. So Tim, it is all winemaking, really. Um, they do a very oxidative style of winemaking in the Jura. And there is when, basically, if I just show you one more time, this slide because I think it's great you can do anything you want in this section but if you get down to the funnel where you vinify and age your wines in an oxidative style you have created a typical and quality wine it is a wine so distinctive of the sense of place of the Jura but almost everything you did here you can no longer taste so isn't that fascinating that we've only done the first part of the funnel and actually, you can almost throw throw all of this out if you have a highly engaged 
way of making your wine at the end, which is what the Jura has. It has this incredible, um, beautiful way of making these salty, oxidized uh, wines. And they are in the style of sherry. That is entirely the point. And if you haven't tried a Jura wine, you must, uh, members. They're a lure unto themselves. But because they have such a distinctive vinification process, they have made a quality and typical wine, but not using this stuff here on the left hand side of the screen. So that's the best way I can describe it. Almost it means that the winemaker becomes the gatekeeper. They decide whether they want to reflect the climate of the year, the soils that it's grown on, the, you know, the whatever it might be. The winemaker has the last um, call at the end of the day about how much they want to demonstrate that in their wine. And actually, that's why a lot of the beautiful definitions of terroir talk about the winemaker's choice or the winemaker's um uh encouragement of the terroir because at the end of the day the winemaker can choose whether or not to sing about the terroir or not um, and if you're buying a you know mass market wine that doesn't taste of taste of very much it's probably a blend of loads of different places it doesn't have an identity um and there's a reason for that you know it's, it's more affordable etc but the winemaker hasn't sat there and gone i'm going to make this taste like 10 different vineyards in the central valley of california and two different grapes They've not made that choice. Whereas the winemakers that are choosing to uh, recognize terroir and encourage the terroir into the glass are the people that really focus on that, that um, left side of the screen, unless they make a style so distinctive that the winemaking is what defines the region. So complicated answer, but a really interesting question. Right, um, final question, because I, it actually leads on to something that I'm going to mention. Um, so a gentleman called Garfield has said in the chat, I visited Trapiche in Mexico, well, Trapiche in Mexico, and they have planted Malbec and made sev separate wines in different soils to demonstrate the difference of terroir. Is this a definitive method to demonstrate terroir? Yes, and Mendoza is an incredibly interesting place where arguably some of the most fascinating terroir is within, um, you know, a very short distance of itself. You hear, um, you hear the uh, vineyards, you know, you have to drive half an hour to get a climate and soil change that would take you seven hours driving through France. Um, it's a slight exaggeration, but you get the idea. And um, so in a very small space, they can have a lot of variation. Because of that, it's an incredible place to experiment. And I would like to plug, uh, we have an event coming up with Laura Catena, and I would argue she is probably the world leading expert uh, on these kinds of experiments. She started an institute called the Catena Institute, and she is joining us for an event on um, vineyards at altitude. I'm going to even, sorry, excuse me, typing, but I'm going to plug it in the chat if, unless Mahesh is happy to. Uh, but we've got an event with her called um, Wines with Altitude um, coming up. And I would strongly recommend if you've enjoyed understanding nuance today, um, that is going to be the event for you. We've got three different experts talking about how altitude, so one element of terroir, how it affects their wine. And um, Laura Catena is going to wax lyrical, Dr. Laura Catena, I should say, is going to wax lyrical about exactly that. So please do join us on the 11th if you want to hear more and go into a deep dive on one particular component of terroir, because it's going to be, um, it's going to be serious. Uh, right, so I hope you enjoyed. It's, <laughs> it's been an intense one this evening. So thank you all for hanging on. Um, <laughs> If there was something I didn't answer, please let me know. I hope that if anybody has opened these wines this evening, um, oh, sorry, Mahesh said witch tasting. I've actually got it up, Mahesh, so I will plug it into the chat now. Um, I'll send it around yesterday, uh, yesterday, tomorrow. I've had too much Riesling in Pinot Noir. Um, but I do hope you enjoyed it. It was a huge topic to discuss. We're going to do altitude with some leading experts, like I said, and perhaps we'll ask some experts to come and do some soil as well, because I think um, we could talk more on soil, particularly the likes of people from Riesling and Burgundy that know so much, or Alsace as well. So I hope you had a lovely evening. I'm going to go and enjoy uh, the rest, the, the dregs of my last four wines. <laughs> but have a lovely evening, everyone. If I'm seeing you on Friday for Simon Rogan, fantastic. We're covering one of these wines off again. So if you have bought it twice and you want to keep hold of it, um, it's the Nipster, I think. 
NIPSA. Um, I will see you then. Have a lovely evening all. And thank you again to Mahesh. Cheers.